by Idris Farah, who is a legal practitioner. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Well, this, comment, yeah, this, this comment from the CGN, does it in any way surprise you? Well, um, I'm not surprised. And the reason for that is because um, we have had uh, a state of hanomy in the judiciary for some time now. We have seen very, very bad judgments coming from courts of superior record. You know, and, uh, Why is it very bad? How do you mean? Well, bad in the sense that the judgments are perverse. Perverse in the sense that they do not, do, they do not show justice. They are mm. devoid of justice. And where litigants don't get justice in court, it's unfortunate. They resort to self help So we have had a series of bad judgments from courts of uh, record in this country for some time now. So I, I'm not surprised. Hold on. You, you said that they're bad judgments because they do not... I'm sorry, I didn't quite get you there. Okay. The judgments are bad because mm -hmm. they are perverse. There is no iota of justice in such judgments. They are devoid of justice. And the essence of adjudication is to do justice, to dispense justice. Well, she was referring... To, when she was talking about justice or judgments, she was talking about you know, some things that are basic. For instance, she says, a judge should write in a simple and unambiguous manner such that it leaves no one in doubt as to what the judgment has addressed. Is, are those part of the things that you find? Because, I mean, there are times when the judgment is passed and people are saying, what did it exactly mean? Does it mean this or does it mean that? In that particular situation, can you say that the judgment was perverse or the judge just wasn't clear? Well, um, if a judgment is ambiguous or ambivalent, it may not necessarily be bad. A judgment may not be clear, but there may still be some semblance of justice in that judgment. But essentially, a judgment must be clear and simple for litigants to understand, for the man on the street, the average man on the street, to understand the essence of that and the purpose of that judgment. So, but on the other hand, if a judgment is bad, or perverse, it is different from what people expect at the end of adjudication. And a judgment that is bad, a judgment that is bad, lacks the basic requirements or features of a good judgment. Such as? Uh, okay. The features of a good judgment are, one, the judgment must be clear, two, the judgment must evaluate the evidence adduced or led at the trial, then there must be a, a summary of the material facts of the case, then the, the, the judgment must also show a deep understanding of the issues for determination at the trial, then the judgment, again, must show the reasons for the judgment mm. or the decision, and the decision itself. Mm. Don't they so, give that in judgments these days? Well, uh, there have been so many judgments that are devoid of those features, as I have said. There are some judgments that meet those requirements. But for some time now, we have had so many bad judgments Can you give us that give cause for worry. In for instance, I was here some time ago on the issue of uh, the police pension uh, fraud. I mean, that's, that's a very bad judgment. Bad in the sense that it is devoid of justice. What people ordinarily expect was not what was handed out or dished out by the court. Was and not only was that, ambiguous? the judgment was not ambiguous, but the judge in that case failed to do justice. A judgment may not be ambiguous, but may, a judgment may be ambiguous, but may still have some element or features of a good judgment. But a judgment should not at all be ambiguous. Mm. So, so and not only that, there are, so, there are some other examples. For instance, there was a case of a governor in which uh, the judge gave a judgment that the governor should never be arrested, should never be investigated. That's, 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 that's a very, very bad judgment. But do we really get the facts of that case? Because, I mean, I heard different lawyers say different things about that one because some of them actually think that, well, if the AFCC thinks <coughs> that that judgment was wrong, they would have challenged it in the first instance, and that what I was saying was that it was the state house of assembly that can investigate the governor, 
Uh, that, that's not necessarily the EFCC. Okay. So different schools of thought uh, on that. Yeah, that's and EFCC correct. themselves. Have you heard anything from them about that case? Well, I, I think there is an appeal against that judgment, yes. And uh, it is wrong to say that it is the State House of Assembly that has powers to investigate a governor. If there are criminal allegations, for instance, against a governor, the police is the organization or department of government that is constitutionally empowered to investigate criminal activities. Although we know that government ha governors have uh, immunities. But that is not a bar against the investigatory powers of police. Yeah, but in what circumstance was that which you referred to granted that they should never be arrested. Was it really the case? I don't understand your question. When you talk about the judgment saying that the, a governor should never be arrested, was it exactly that way? And in what it, circumstances? It, it was, was exactly given? that way. I, the, the particular governor in question uh, was invited, I think by the EFCC or ICPC, that would be two. And he went to court to challenge the invest, inv invitation sent to him. And the court dished out that judgment that he should not be arrested, he should not be investigated. That was the case. And you say that was wrong. It's totally wrong. So how come when they have the NBA, the NJC, all those bodies give an official position? Of course they did. Law? They did. They, the judgment was condemned. Including the NJC? It was condemned. But one thing that we need to understand is that it's not every day that the NJC sits to discipline judges. They have certain periods they meet. Uh, petitions, they look, they, they, they deliberate over petitions against judges, and it is when petitions come to them, or when they initiate such uh, investigations, that we hear such uh, official positions from them. They meet periodically. It's not, a daily, it's not on a daily basis that the NJC meets. So and when they meet, they do what is expected of them in such instances. Mm. You know, looking at what... Uh, the, or before uh, the, where this was actually uh, mooted or said, you remember that she also was talking about refresher courses for judges. Perhaps uh, could we also say some of them maybe uh, they have actually forgotten some of <laughs> the professional conduct that they should exhibit in uh, the, the discharge of their duties. Well, that that is not impossible. It is not impossible. Uh, we have. Uh, Add series of uh, occasions where you wonder whether the presiding officer in the court actually practiced before being appointed I mean, to the bench. So it's possible that some of them forget the process of adjudication. And uh, that brings about the necessity for refresher courses being conducted for them. And uh, also, I would like to say that the, the process of appointing judges should be overhauled. Only lawyers who practice law rigorously should be appointed to the bench. How is it because, now? How is it now? The well, uh, for some years now, at least, I, I, I am very sure that there have been some judges who were appointed from the companies, uh, from uh, private businesses and, uh, you know, all that, which, which is not proper. You must have practiced law. You should have practiced law. So you must have a background in law. Yes. Are you saying that people who have no background no, in law... When you say background, you have to yeah. be clear about it. I'm talking about experience in law. Exactly. Practice. Actual practice. Not being called to the bar, then you venture into a company for 5, 10 years, 15 years, then all of a sudden you are appointed